my name is Tatiana Hart, and I, uh, I'm happy to be here. So I love the women that are here. I think you guys are great. Um, I've been sober for, it'll be uh, coming up on five years in June. <laughs> um, this isn't the first time I've gotten sober, but it's different this time. And I'll tell you why. So, um, you know, just a little bit. I, I grew up in a family, there's a lot of screaming. You know, a lot of anger. Um, I There was sexual abuse that was ongoing that started at the age of five. Um, and I didn't realize how big of an impact that had on me until later as an adult. Um, by the time I was 12, I was an alcoholic. I was, my parents worked overnight graveyard, so I kind of had the party house. I was drunk every night. Um, by the time I was 16, I uh, had a suicide attempt, mm -hmm. and that landed me in the Mayo Clinic in the General's building, and I ended up doing my 11th grade out of there. Um, from there, I ended up in foster care. So, I was very hard to live with because, one, I was a teenager with all that stuff going on. And two, I was severely in addiction. I was an alcoholic. I was taking anything. I was big into LSD, mm -hmm. marijuana. Um, you know, I wouldn't go to school. I would just go to take my tests. I would ace them, but I would get D's and S because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, so when I ended up in general, so it was the first time I felt safe. And I ended up staying there, and then that's how I got into my first drug treatment. Now my mom and my my dad, the man who raised me, they're very supportive. You know, she um, it, as a parent, you don't really know how to handle everything that's going on inside of your children, and she didn't. But she was there the best she could. She would drive up to see me in treatment um, every week, and I was going to treatment in Woodbury, and she was in Rochester. Um, I would stay sober long enough, as long as I was in a contained building, and then I would just start drinking again. Um, I ended up in foster care because I was hard to live with, and my mom was too. And in foster care, uh, things just went very worse. Um, I ended up moving to Scottsdale, Arizona at the age of 18. Yeah, with my foster family, my parents thought it would be good for me to get away from Rochester. They thought maybe, you know, just get me out of there, maybe I'd do better. Um, I was in 12th grade, I was hiding in the stairwells, I was scared, I didn't know anybody, I would just sit there and read my books, and then just one day I just, things were going on with my foster dad, I just got up, got in my car, and I took off, and I was a missing person for like six months. And my mom was terrified. And they had missing reports, missing uh, person posters out for me. Um, I didn't call home. I didn't anything. I just traveled up Highway 101 through California, showered in surfer style, stayed in my car, and I felt free. I didn't know what freedom was, and I wasn't free, but I felt safe. Um, that just went into hard drugs. I ended up getting uh, 19 doing meth and heroin intravenously for the first time. And everything went from there. Um, I started in Salt Lake City, I started diving into the prostitution area. Um, and I'm covering this part for a reason. So. that kind of took me into a whole different realm of addiction. And there comes a point in time in addiction where you are no longer chasing something, but you're being chased and you can't tell the difference. You just can't stop. You just can't sit still and you can't stop. At 19, I ended up going home and my mom like, let's get you into treatment. So she took me to Albert Lee. I think it was Albert Lee. Um, and it was a Saturday. And I was waiting for them to come visit me. 
And from being on the road, I had like dreadlocks and hemp necklaces. I was like this hippie, whatever. Um, <laughs> and I walked into this gift, gift shop and I was looking at these crosses and the lady at the cash register said, do you know what that means? I said, no. So she told me about Jesus. Wow. She told me about the gospel mm. and I didn't understand it. But I knew I like I couldn't look away. I just I was just enthralled. And she prayed with me to receive salvation. And I left there different. And I didn't understand at the time. So I just ended up going back out. I didn't have church. I didn't really know what to do with any of that. You need you need we need each other. We need each other to to help us grow in Christ. I didn't have any of that. So Within four months, I was off and running again. Um, by this time, I was in Arizona, back in Arizona, severely on heroin, meth. I was so deep into the um, trafficking and the prostitution. I, I was involved in stuff that was so dark, I didn't even know it existed until I was face to face with it. And I was stuck and I was trapped until I got arrested. At 27, I got arrested. And I was in Sheriff Joel Ohio, Tent City, and I withdrew for the first time in August out in Tent City. <laughs> I withdraw, I'm like, what is happening to me? <laughs> it was terrible. But I went to Bible studies. I knew to ask for a Bible, and I just started following this lady around, because like, I knew she was going to Bible studies. And I, and I encountered God. I encountered Jesus Christ. And when I left there, I went into um, a discipleship. It was a, a, a ministry, kind of like Teen Challenge, but it's six months. It's in Arizona, Church on the Street. And I was there, and I was sober, and I was just pursuing God, and I was involved in ministry, and I was sober, and I was busy. And But the one thing is, is I never dealt with anything that caused me to, to tip over every time. Because all of those emotions, all of those memories, they're still there. Mm -hmm. I ended up getting married at 30, which was far reaching. Like nobody, my, my family was shocked. Um, and I wasn't ready for it, either was he. I was a mess, I was a mess. So we were, we were house parents um, of a sober house. And we were, you know, I was, we were involved in ministry, but he had been using the whole time. I was sober, but I was still like not sober for my emotions. I was still very erratic. Um, I was really, really sweet, or I was very abusive. I was physically abusive with him. Um, and it's like this rage would come up in me. I couldn't control it. I'd just be so angry, and I didn't know why. So. What happened there is our marriage fell apart. I left him, I had an affair, and I left him to be with a woman, which was something I just was always used to because they were safe. Mm -hmm. So as soon as like stuff started happening with him, I was just like, I'm out, <laughs> you know? And mm -hmm. I left everything. I left the church, I left my dogs, I left my job, I left everything to come back to Minnesota to be with this woman. We ended up, it ended up going into a seven year relapse. So I was staying in my, my dad's basement you know, and I'm working online for a doctor and I'm help take care of him, but I am just back deep into addiction and I get Chrissy starts using with me. My mom came to stay with us for the last two years of that using, last three years, four years, she was there. And she came because she wanted to love me. <laughs> So she lived, uh, stayed upstairs. Me and Chrissy stayed in the basement. We were there, my dad's, for six years. My dad was, you know, in his room, and she just loved me. I was, there was either two states to me. I was either very obviously high or obviously withdrawing, and she just sat with me no matter what. She just sat with me and just was the same. She would just talk to me, and she would clean up after me and then, you know, it wasn't like an enabling thing, but she just loved me in my mess and she never made me feel bad. 
like and before that would cause me to spiral worse when I felt you already feel lower than low you know what I mean but I was so messed up I couldn't feel anything and and I was just my addiction was like this hurricane and it just everybody around me was impacted nobody wasn't untouched by it I was high the whole time my family was the ones that were suffering they were aware they put up they were aware with the feelings of watching me they're aware with the feelings of being victims of me in my you know mm-hmm. when people are addicted and I was checked out I felt nothing I was hard I was dark I was harder and darker than before I ever knew Christ because yeah. I had turned away from him And I remember I'd come upstairs and my mom would be sleeping on the couch and I would just stand there and I would just stare at her. And I would just, my heart would just open up and I'd feel such compassion and I'd feel tender. And I would just be so sorry. I'm like, I'm so sorry, mom, but I couldn't, I couldn't physically say these things. I couldn't break out of this thing that had a grip on me. But it was her love, it was her, you know? She pursued me in such a way. And she just kept, she felt bad, she's like, I'm so sorry, I feel like, you know, you're so screwed up because of my parenting, (laughs) you know? And she just really wanted me, she really wanted to make up for all those years. And I wasn't able to receive her. I wasn't able to receive her, I was like a stone wall. But I did receive her. I did, I just wasn't able to show it. Um, so, back for August 2016, I get the news that Skip, my estranged husband, he died of a <coughs> overdose. And then following that in September, so my mom, a couple months before that, she moved back to Louisiana because like she couldn't, she said, I just can't handle this because I was so, either nothing or angry, nothing or angry, and it was starting to mess with her mentally. She said she couldn't take it, she had to leave. Um, So, (coughs) September, she gets diagnosed with leukemia, and I called her, I'm like, Mom, what can I do? And she said, if you would just pray for me, I'd be healed. I'm like, I am like, messed up i'm like that is no i was i don't even think about god anymore and i'm like i can't pray for her (coughs) and i didn't i didn't pray for her so fast forward um the last september december me and christy are making my dad breakfast and i went to go wake him up and he had passed in his sleep (coughs) i found his body um my brothers came to do the funeral service. I was totally gone. I couldn't even be present for that. Um, I made it to his funeral. I came in late, an absolute mess. I don't even want to know what I look like. And uh, I wish that I didn't even go because I feel like I was a spectacle. Um, so I just went further, further, further using. So that was in December, January 29th, my mom passed of that, it was 2017. But before she did, she was in hospice and I was able to call her. So it was a grace of God, because I was like, I'm so sorry, mom. I was able to say everything that I felt when I was watching her sleep. I was able to just say it and she just grunted. She just would only be able to moan, but I know she did. (laughs) And then two weeks after that, Chrissy died due to her addiction. And I carried that because I, she started using with me. Four months after that, well, two months after that, I'm sitting in my dad's house and it's abandoned. People have broken in, stolen stuff, stolen the copper, whatever. And I'm just in there and it's in the middle of winter and I'm trying to find a van. I'm trying to find a van. And I became aware of such a deep emptiness. It was like this emptiness that we reached way down past me, down into the earth, it felt like. And I couldn't cry out, but I know my heart cried out. 
four months after that, I had a heroin overdose, but it was fentanyl. I had to be revived. The week after that, I ended up in Mayo Clinic for a few days because I had uh, complications from that and an a, um, infection in my blood around my heart. And I was in that uh, hospital bed and I was laying there and I was so relieved and I thought, maybe this is it, maybe this is gonna stop. And then the thought is like, maybe I don't have to die like this. And then when I thought that, I just felt Jesus come into the room. I felt the Holy Spirit fill that room for the first time. I felt him in over seven years. And I knew that I had to choose either get up and go forward with him or I could go back, but I would die. And I chose him. I chose him. Oh. And I said, I can't leave this hospital room unless I got a treatment lined up. And they contacted the space based treatment. And, um, and you know, Tony Fondi was on the phone with me. <laughs> tell like he walked me through those doors. It was quite a, it was quite a ordeal because I had 30 days of bed rest. So I'm like, how am I going to stay sober? And I didn't, but I was drinking and smoking pot just to get me in the door, you know, but so 30 days and then I, I, I go through this long-term treatment and I just deal with grief. Because this is what happens. When you come to the realization of who you've been, the things you've said, the things you've done, and how much, I realize how much I put my family through. It hit me all at once and I couldn't say nothing to no one because they had passed. So I was just buried under this weight. So I created my own contract where I just walked myself through. I, had, I sat the Holy Spirit down with me and I said, Holy Spirit, I got it. I need you to help me. And I just walked through everything I needed to say that didn't get said, everything I needed to receive that I didn't receive. And I just pretty much walked myself through my own process with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and he was with me through the whole thing and I was able to get some relief to continue going forward so then I get to the point where I meet Wendy Laurie and um, she led me through prayer ministry and that changed so much for me mm. and I went back to my room and I have heard the Lord say uh, I want you to help her I'm like help her do what you know, he's like, you have a choice, because I was going to be the maintenance woman at 17, or at the building I was in, or help her. I'm like, okay. So I went into her office. I was like, I'm supposed to help you. And she's like, do what? I'm like, I don't know. Because <laughs> <laughs> during the time in treatment, I took all my clothes. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, I received the Holy Spirit when I was 27, but I didn't know, because when I was saved before, I didn't know you can pray in the Spirit every day. I thought it was something that came upon you, like the prophets in the Old Testament. That's it. <laughs> no, you can pray every day. So I would sit in my closet and I would sit in silence. It's the only way I could get all these voices to stop. And I would pray in the spirit every day, every night. So I started doing that in our office. Three hours in the morning, three hours at night. And before I know it, I leave there. We're in ministry together. We're building a ministry and we had housing and we've gone away from housing and now it's gone into prayer ministry so we meet these pastors ukrainian pastors vito and eugenia kashuvin um and this was right after um i told wendy because i was doing all these other tasks and i'm like i'm not supposed to be doing any of these she's like what are you supposed to be doing i'm like i'm supposed to pray i feel god leading me to pray in spirit for eight hours a day and that was hard to start. It took a couple weeks. But she was like, do it. Just do it. And things will figure themselves out. So I just stopped doing everything I was doing, which I thought was like scary. But I just did it. And it got figured out. God brought the people. You just, you got to step into it. And then you provide. You can't wait for things to, that's the opposite of faith. Um, so I did that. And then all of a sudden, women in our care started they were demonized and these demons started coming out. We didn't know what to do. So Vito and Eugenia, we met them and they led us through prayer ministry and how to help women who have, you know, are demonized or have such trauma, they can't even break out of it. 
So that's what we did. And I did the prayer. I prayed during the day. And then there was two months where um, I was doing nothing. And I was like, what am I doing? And God had moved me into a different ministry. And which was having me prayer in the spirit overnight for people who have a hard time at night. Because the Holy Spirit knows the perfect prayer. He prays the perfect will of God. Like, I don't know how to pray for people, but he does. Mm -hmm. He does. So I just sit up at night, I write scriptures, and I pray in the spirit, and whoever comes on listens, they listen. And I believe that I am helping them through that. Mm -hmm. That I'm just, the Holy Spirit is helping them through that. I'm just praying. I don't know what I'm saying. Yeah, Yeah, live. On Facebook and YouTube, it's Seven Bells, Third Watch. Yeah, yeah, I've been doing it for several months. So this is the thing. I went through years and years and years of therapy. And as a result of that, I thought healing was learning how to just live with what you've been through and come to a place where you can change your perspective of it enough to live the least destructive life oh. and for me that was to not do heroin not do meth <laughs> mm-hmm. if I was just drinking I thought I was successful mm-hmm. but then I met Jesus mm-hmm. and this is what I didn't speak of also I did. so Paul says in Philippians I said, I count, he says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Mm-hmm. And I consider all things lost and rubbish mm-hmm. that I may gain Christ. I had to come to a point where I had to let everything go. I had to come to a point where I had to let Christ come in and heal me. I had to let go of my past. I had to let go of the people. I had to let go of myself. I had to let go of my love for addiction. Because my parents put me in all these treatments. I could be in jail, I could be in all these places, and they didn't do a thing. The only thing that touched me was Jesus Christ. Amen. The only thing that touched me is Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. I'm going to that because I'm going to finish this with this one thing. So I was praying. I was praying all night, and I went to lay down. And I was thinking, God, you're so amazing. I'm like, just thank you for this life I live. Thank you that I can do this. Thank you that I'm able to live Mm -hmm. without regret. Mm -hmm. And then I can feel. Mm -hmm. And then I was thinking about the time when I was 19, when that woman told me about Jesus. Even though I didn't leave and follow Jesus, that always stuck with me. Mm-hmm. I always remembered the words she said. And that's how I knew I need Christ. When I got arrested at 27 and I asked for the Bible and went to Bible study, that's how I knew that's what I needed. It's because I remembered that conversation. Mm-hmm. And I realized I had an encounter with Jesus that day. I realized this, and this was just just this last October. And I was thinking about that that lady, and I was like, if she could see me now. (laughs) 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 So then all of a sudden, it was like this this bubble went up in me, and it popped. Mm -hmm. And all I heard was, that was Wendy. Mm like no way I would ask her so the next day we were at Breakthrough Ministries and I was sitting next to her and and I forgot all about it until the pastor was speaking about something I said did you work at a bookstore at this time at this place at this location she said yeah I didn't either when we know you. So I'm going to do this one thing. Prayer is not something we just do. It's 
who we are because God created us. The reason we have a spirit is for God to contact us through our spirit. That's the reason we have a spirit man. It's the way how God contacts us and communicates with us and we communicate with him. So I go through all of these years of therapy just to get to a place where I can live with what I've always ran from. And then at 44, I was set free through prayer. And when Jesus comes in and you forgive and you break these strongholds and you break these agreements and you sever these soul ties, I got deliverance and I got prayer and set free because two years ago I went to the very prayer team I was on and said I need help because all that garbage from when I was in prostitution I could still it was still here and I'm like I, I can't live under this weight anymore I'm in I'm in prayer and I can't escape it they led me through prayer ministry and I'm free Amen. I was free in a half an hour I was free of something that plagued me for 24 years and I was in ministry stuff. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to end with this. <laughs> 22 years ago, I wrote a poem. And it was at, the, it was at I was 22 years old. I'm 44 today. And it was the pinnacle of what I thought I had achieved of healing. From here, I was in college. I was doing great. And until I ended up in waking up in, in the hospital because... They found me in a snowbank and I was overdosed on PCP and cocaine. I'm like, I don't even know. I don't, I don't remember nothing. I don't remember. I was on my way to finals. But I wrote this poem before that happened. So it's part of And then I wrote another poem two months ago. And it was about a poem that is the pinnacle of healing. And it is through Jesus Christ. And it happens through prayer. And it begins with us. We need to spend that time with God in prayer. Even if it's just being silent and knowing he is God, that is the best prayer. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the foundation that I've been standing on. Mm -hmm. So this poem is brief. It's called Two Poems. Mm -hmm. There's two parts. The first one is to the first man, and I wrote it at 22. And it's to, you know, just growing up in sexual abuse and, and then going into sexual exploitation it was written towards those people that I, I'm free of this. The second poem is called To the Second Man. Amen. And that's the one that actually set me free. Amen. So this is the first man. You will never know this woman I am. You will never feel the depth of my emotions or what lies beneath this skin. You will never know this life that I live. And I won't forget your memory that has haunted my life. You can hold down these hands, but you cannot hold these things that I hold. You can break in my body like a thief, but you cannot break the soul. And you can feel power for you can make me scream, but you won't rip this heart out of me or destroy the dreams that I dream. You can leave me laying damaged, naked, and torn apart, but you can't take away this light, this light that shines through the dark. Mm. Now this is to the second man. <laughs> I sit silent as the air you reside in. To love you as strong as the waves that bring the tide in. To give you the depth of all I could be. For you created me. And I stand up tall above piles of fallen bricks and broken stones of the walls and structures that once were the confines of my home. The dust is settled and I can clearly see endless stairs reaching far beyond me. And my eyes grow wider as light warms my face. I begin to smell and I begin to taste the sweet breeze through my hair that increases with each step of the stairs. 
The higher I climb, the farther I go, the less I remember of what I used to know. And at that last step of the stairs, I gaze upon the hope I held you from the start. For there sits my king upon the throne of my heart. I look back to see that you had reached down into the pit of the darkness in me, and you brought me up into your light. I'm a child of the day and not of the night. I fall at your feet. There's nothing I could give that compares to your love from by which I live. So I give you all of me as your dwelling place, your sanctuary. And that's what prayer does. Amen. Amen.